Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today I'm going to talk about how I made this rocket set. So this is another low poly model set which is hand painted for the game Atlas Empires. You can find much more on my playlist for Atlas Empires along with lots of other playlists like hand painting and beginners tutorials. You'll also find links in the description to the actual game itself, Atlas Empires, so do check them out. So you can see the concept art in the top right there. It's fantastic work from Chris Handlauser. And where possible, I've been trying to stick as closely as I can to those. You can see that I'm bringing in other models from other sets that I've done. It's just a bit easier. I will slightly paint these and adapt these so I don't copy the maps. It would be too awkward to uh, link different objects to different maps in the set. So, so I just reuse the textures and bake them into this new set. Once they're baked onto this new set, then I can adapt them slightly, repaint them if necessary, and so on. It's a very slightly tricky process that you have to sort of set up two UV maps. One is the original, and then one is the new one that you're baking to, and then sort of delete the old one once you've done the new one. And I will do another tutorial on that later on in depth. It will be part of my baking tutorial list. As for the modeling, you can see it's fairly straightforward again. It's all fairly simplistic, really low poly modeling, and you're just looking to get the silhouette. That's the main thing, always looking at that silhouette, figuring out, moving around the object a lot, but figuring out where things need to go so that you have the outline of the model. And everything like the hard edges or the highlights, that's all painted on, so shadows and things like that. So really the modeling stage is quite straightforward and simplistic. There are certain aspects that you want to know when you're painting. I got a lot of this detail from, I think it's 80 level, um, the site, and it talks has lots of game articles basically, and talks about hand painted techniques in one of their articles. And one of them is just so fantastic, it gave loads of insight into uh, making hand painted things look realistic and the techniques you need to do and use in order for them to look realistic and uh, make your life easier as well. I'll try and remember to put the link in the description. I often forget that, so do remind me if you're listening and want to know the link to that. But it's 80 level, and they have lots of great articles and things like that on there. I do have a detailed tutorial about how to paint the rope, which um, I'm doing at the moment, or modeling at the moment. And yes, there is an obvious issue here with fire and rope, but it is um, fire retardant rope, so that's fine. And all the wood is fire retardant as well, so that's, that's great. All these models have special magical properties so that they're not affected by the fire, but the rocket is. I think that's important to mention, really. On a more serious note, you can see how low detail the rope is. Uh, there's not loads of intricate details. It's all to do with the hand painting that gives it that depth and detail. I'm keeping these sort of brick bits nice and simple as well. I add a bevel modifier here and there to give it some character and then just move around and uh, adapt the shape so it gives it uh, some life and some individuality and sort of duplicate and repeat and so forth. So you can see that it's fairly simplistic still, nothing too complicated. You'll notice as well, I don't worry too much about n-gons, they all get converted to triangles in the end and it's just easier to modeling n-gons if you need to. You can only really do that on flat faces. If it's anything that's going around a corner, then the n-gon will look really odd and just won't work. So you'll need to triangulate those. Here I'm using the mirror modifier. You have to be a bit careful with the mirror modifier. Uh, I'm doing a sort of modular approach that I talk about a lot. And generally speaking, mirror modifiers are great or mirroring is great because it cuts down on the texture space, so you get a nice lot of space and pixels to work with. But you do have the problem that the texture is exactly repeated, so for something like metal, that can be a bit of a pain because your highlights should be different and reflections should be different in different places, so it can look a bit odd if the mirror is quite close to each other and you can really see the duplication, so you have to be a bit careful of that. I'm spending a fair bit of time modeling the oven bit, or this meta metallic oven that's here. And that's sometimes the tricky bit of knowing how detailed you need to go. Again, just look at the silhouette, look at the outline of your shape, and that's the main and most important. So uh, where you're looking at an angle, uh, do the things stick out and protrude? If they don't, and they should, then you'll need more topology. If you're looking at an angle and you think, well, this vertex or this 
um, shape or polygon here doesn't really need to be there because it's not sticking out, then you can get rid of it. It's complicated to explain, but you can hopefully see how much detail I'm putting into these objects. It's something you do get with experience as well. Occasionally I put a bevel in and I'm not sure whether that's correct or not and there might be an extra polygon that I don't really need but sometimes it's best to go just a few more polygons than you need rather than too few. You can actually add polygons in the process of painting but it's very awkward and you can only add them in certain places otherwise your textures will start to stretch. So if you need to extrude a whole chunk out of a model your textures will all stretch and you'll need to unwrap that separately and then you'll need to find some space in your UV unwrap unless you want to paint everything again or bake it onto a new map. So it can be quite awkward and in a sense destructive this process. So as soon as you start painting uh, you're kind of stuck with what you've got unless you've got a bit of free UV space. Part of the trick here is often finding which objects you can repeat and duplicate and use again. So the feet for example are an obvious one. Uh, they're quite small and no one's going to notice that they've been duplicated and repeated. They could even take up a very small portion of my UV map so I could make them very small on my UV area and just take up almost a pixel of colour because they're so minute and small and they're going to be one uniform colour. You can see the detail I'm having to go into with this model because there's some nice aspects and nice details to it but the more you detail you go into the more polygons you have and also there's quite a lot of individuality in this set so there's not a lot of repetition only in things like the rocket obviously that means when it comes down to painting I'm going to have very little texture space and that's why I'm cutting out all these sections here making sure that they don't overlap and they're not unnecessarily needed it's good practice where possible to cut down on any overlap anyway especially if you've got faces that aren't going to be seen. With this modular approach it's important that if I've got something that's copied it will be a link duplicate so if I change anything on the link duplicate it will update to all the other ones so I'll paint them first before deleting faces. I had a fair bit of fun modeling these billows, they're a tough shape so it was tricky to get them right and I'm trying to mirror things where possible so I don't have too much texture space taken up and you can see that I've sort of duplicated one side over to the other. You can also see that I'm using a fair few polygons to do this, but it's good fun and it looks good in the end, so I just went with the amount of polys that I needed. You can see also that I'm extending out the billows and giving them more of that sort of concertina look. It may have been unnecessary, but I just felt it didn't quite have the look correct when it only had sort of three of those concertina bits and four just made it look a bit more correct. You sometimes have to do that as a modeler, think whether uh, simplicity is more important or the overall look and design and shape. So you really have to judge and uh, be a designer as well as a technical modeler. And you're both thinking about the aesthetics of the shape, but also the amount of polygons. So it can be quite a tricky process, low poly modeling, but really rewarding as well. There are times where I have to cut down and simplify the design because it's just taking up too many polygons or maybe unnecessary polygons at times. Interestingly, this model took quite a long time. I'm not sure quite why it was so long, but I suppose there weren't many modular pieces, so lots of it was individual and not much of it was reused. This time lapse is actually 12 times the speed of what I'm working at. That's in terms of kind of straight modeling and screen recording. There's lots that goes on behind it as well where I'm experimenting with different things and finding reference images and so forth as well. So I'm almost there with the modeling. You can see that I'm just adapting some of the shapes and uh, pulling them around, giving them that individual and sort of personality sort of feel. This stage is quite important, I would say. To me it does give it that personality that sometimes you don't see in other pieces of work. Sometimes a sort of quirkiness or character. I have to be a bit careful because I can't make it too characterised because of the modular approach. So if you have sort of strong character elements they'll be just repeated loads of times and that can look a bit awkward and odd. You can see I'm going through the unwrap process at the moment. So I unwrap all the objects first, you can see them on the left hand side being unwrapped and I use that just to check that the unwraps worked but I will unwrap them all together onto one map so that select them all into edit mode 
and then unwrap. And when you do that, they all go onto one map. That's a really useful feature in Blender 2.8. The fact that you can go into multiple objects with edit mode and then unwrap them all together is amazing. You used to have to use this plugin called Texture Atlas, and it was a bit glitchy and buggy and awkward to use. Most likely the fact that it was user error rather than anything else, but it was difficult to understand and quite uh, tricky. You do have to watch out a bit. If you've missed anything, it can be a real pain. So you can see I'm going through uh, making sure that I've unwrapped everything and just finding out uh, where there's issues or glitches. You can see it looks an okay unwrap there and everything looks fine, but occasionally you get something that's overlapping something else. Sometimes you miss it. I think there is a way of showing overlap. It might be a plugin actually, but I can't remember. Generally, it's fairly easy to spot and I like to go through my UV maps uh, with a sort of fine tooth comb anyway. So here you can see that I'm just baking from a old map into a new one. Again, you, you have to set up a new UV map and then bake it across to the new texture. So where I'm taking these logs or the bucket type thing, I've baked the map onto this new map. This process does seem a lot easier in 2.8. I'm not sure quite why that is, but I'm having much less glitches and much less problems with it. You can see the logs all going a bit funny and they look like they've gone wrong, but that's actually because uh, the UV map is changing and updating. And you can see now that I've changed across to the final bake, it looks fine. And so now I'm on to the painting process. And this is my favorite process, where the models really come to life. Now what I'm doing is I'm painting in the glow of the fire. The fire will be added as a particle effect, but I'm painting in the glow so you can see the effects of it. Remember there's lots of playlists on hand painting techniques and I go into detail with some aspects. So I need to do a bit more of that as well as I've learned more as I've been going along. The tough bit was the metal bit. It was really interesting and good fun trying to get this sort of metal panel texture look. And I always start the same way, so fill in the base color, so that main color that you want the texture to be, then sort of dab on a bit of color, then start adding in the detail. And you can see that's what I'm doing now, sort of adding in a bit of detail, basically the shading. I think some people prefer to start from a completely dark canvas and then sort of build up with light or a light canvas and bring down into the shades. I prefer to start from the middle and put dark bits on that I want and light bits on. And you can see that's what I'm doing here, just highlighting the very edges of the metal. I did have problems with this. The texture map was so detailed and there was so much in it that you can start to see the pixels when you get in close. And that made it tough for painting. For this model, I didn't really want it to repeat, especially these metallic bits, because I feel like they don't quite work if they're like that. It is repeated across one side to the other, so there is a mirror in there, but it's normal for me to do this four times over, so I'd actually do a mirror X and Y, but in this case I only did it in one axis so that it's not too obvious it's mirrored. You can see me doing these rivets. I just do a dark spot and then a light spot on top of it, and that tends to work okay. This isn't as detailed as I would have liked to have gone. I feel like it's uh, lacking a little bit of depth, but it works out all right in the end. I'm adding a bit of rust drip here as well, so sort of brownie color across as if it's dripping down from those rivets. Lastly, I just put a bit of highlights in there, so a shiny white, so there's a glare or a highlight just on the edge of some of them. I think it may have been a bit too much with the highlighting actually, so it sticks out a bit too much, but I felt like there wasn't enough depth in places. So you can see me here rubbing out a few of those highlights just to give them a bit more character. Now here I've gone in with a darker brush and I feel like I might have gone a bit too far with this, so a bit too much shading. And again, I was worried about that depth that it didn't seem to have, but it seems to just about work anyway. I'm usually fairly rough in bits that really probably won't be seen, like the underneath of the rocket, and just uh, worry about the very edges of that. But I tend to think it's important to have some sort of color there and don't leave it completely blank or weird anyway. And the last bit you can see me doing is the glow from the fire. So it looks a bit odd at the moment, but I'll give it a yellow glow so it looks like it's uh, picking up the light from the fire. That's why I wanted all these logs to be individual so that I could paint that red onto them. Otherwise, I think they'd look quite odd if they didn't have any glow to them at all. It can be a bit tricky not knowing exactly what the particle effect is going to look like, but you can get a rough idea of how it's going to be affected. 
So onto the wood here, I've got a couple of tutorials on painting wood now, so hopefully you've got enough detail if you want to try that out for yourself. Again, base colour, get the grain in there, highlights, shadow, fairly straightforward really the wood. And these are obviously repeated round, but they've got exactly the same sort of symmetry going round, so that's absolutely fine. Now the rope I have a detailed tutorial about, so um, you'll see me paint that in a second, but I have actually put that into a much more detailed tutorial where I go through sort of real time. And here I'm working on the bucket design. So you can see that I wanted to bake that onto a new map so that I could use and paint aspects like the glow from the embers and so forth. So that's why it was important to put that onto a new map. And here's the rope as I was saying earlier. So putting in the dark bits, bit of shadow, it's fairly straightforward really, and you can see that on my tutorial where I go into a bit more detail. And it's shadows and highlights, it's always the same. Uh, so base colour, which is the mid colour, then shadows, and then the highlights. I always go in that order, I find it's a bit like if you're sketching, uh, you put the sort of shading in when you're sketching, so that's how I like to work with my pieces and my texture painting. Well you can see here that the colour doesn't match up completely and it slowly gets there with a bit of effort and a bit of work but it's just when you've got two different objects and you haven't given them the same base colour or you've just sort of adapted that base colour slightly it can be a little bit tricky. And you can see I've obviously made a mistake there where I didn't give it an inside so I had to use a spare space on my UV map. And although I did that fairly quickly here, you can probably see it in the very top left corner. So it's a very small bit because it's not really going to be seen, but I need it to be there just in case. If I didn't put that face in there and people were able to look very slightly inside, they'd see completely through the object. And if something's really bright on the other side, it would look really odd. So I just needed that inside model to be really dark so that no one could see through. But it didn't have to be detailed, so it could be a really small, tiny little map in the corner there. So onto the stonework again, I've got more detailed tutorials about how I do this. Just adapting the shape slightly to make sure it fits in and doesn't stick out. And you sometimes have that problem when you go around and you suddenly think, oh, there's a gap there or there's a bit that needs sorting out there. And generally it's not too bad because it's a small glitch, but if it's a big glitch, then it can cause real interruptions in your workflow. Interestingly, with stone actually, I do it slightly differently because I use the highlights a bit earlier than the uh, crevices, so if there's a highlighted edge, uh, then I'll paint that in. But hopefully you get the idea of my process. You can see these character elements. I can do a few character elements like this and not worry too much because it's mirrored across uh, the Y in this case, and you don't really see one side and then the other together. But those character elements can fail if you can see them both together uh, and close together as well. You can also see that I'm painting shadow of other objects, so the ambient occlusion onto the object where I can. And that's a problem when you're doing modular assets because if you paint the ambient occlusion onto one, it will appear on all of them. So you have to be very careful when doing that. And that's a limitation of modular designs as well, that you can't really have the ambient occlusion painted in. I think that's one thing the team realised early on uh, when I started doing the project and they could see from my paintings, uh, they were pleased with my paintings but that was the one thing they felt was lacking was that sort of depth and they've managed to uh, find enough in the sort of performance budget to put a light in the scene and I think that will make a massive difference having one light. It was very difficult to get round that actually with the ambient occlusion and putting in that depth with that modular approach. One thing I have heard, but I'm not sure I've got this right, but I think they actually use models as the shadows. So they just have a very sort of dark gray that they put on top of things uh, to make it look like they're shadows. I feel like that would be a bit harsh and I'm not sure really how well that would work. I can't really remember where I heard about it either. So maybe it's a very old technique. Occasionally I'll need to isolate models where they're uh, stuck behind another model. I found that really awkward in 2.8. In texture painting mode, occasionally if I press this forward slash on the numpad uh, to isolate a model, it just doesn't work. And that's obviously some sort of strange glitch. I haven't actually reported it yet uh, because it's quite busy uh, doing these different things. So it's a bit awkward to try and suddenly report a bug and explain the bug as well is <laughs> quite tough. You can see sometimes, which I have explained before, about uh, the fact that I go from 
soft shading uh, to hard shading. So I use the principal BSDF when I need to see the edges and then I use the emission node when I want to see the final output. Because with that smooth soft shading it's very difficult to see the edges but you need the edges to highlight. If you miss your highlight it can look really awkward when you're moving around your object and suddenly the corner isn't highlighted and it just looks really odd. So make sure your highlights, those sort of white bits that are following the edge, do follow the edge perfectly as you can anyway. That's often a problem with low poly modeling is the edges can be quite sort of jaggedy. So if you're doing a curve, the edges around a curve can be quite sort of lumpy, uh, like a sort of more like a hexagon or something instead of a circle. And you've got to try and find the edge or match the edge as closely as possible when you're doing your highlights. So it can be quite awkward. One thing I don't like at the moment are the way I'm doing cracks. I keep looking at them thinking that's fine, but then I look back and I'm not happy with it. <laughs> it's frustrating. So that's something I need to practice, obviously. I think for this rocky base, I did put quite a few sort of character elements in there because I didn't mirror it and I just forgot to do that. But it means I can add more character elements, which is quite nice. And it's not really a waste of space because I can utilize that space and uh, give it those interesting details. So you can see here I've changed the principal BSDF and I can really easily see the corners and then go around and give them that highlight. I was noticing a glitch in here so there was obviously something wrong with my UV map somewhere. So I went in to just double check. I couldn't find the problem so I just left it and it's not really any sort of big issue but there was some sort of strange glitch that I couldn't paint on one aspect of the model. It's very rare that happens with Blender, but it does happen and it can be extremely frustrating if it's in an important place. This bit was quite fun, sort of painting the fiery glow coming out of the boiler burner thingy-jiggy. Hadn't done many of these sort of things before, so it's quite fun sort of researching the best way to do it and figuring out uh, which sort of colours to use and the right variations so that it did look like it was glowing. You can see me isolating the faces as well. It looks a bit strange at this point because the faces were really isolated so they got very sharp edges to that glow. But in a minute I put a sort of soft yellow light around the whole thing. Uh, right at the end I think I do that. There we go. So I'm adding a bit of a orangey yellowy glow to it and that seems to work. So uh, you don't have to use things like volumetric lighting when you're hand painting. You can paint the volumetrics in yourself. This sort of brush metal was quite fun to paint. Uh, much more difficult is the shiny metal because of the reflections. So if you are choosing hand painted characters, beware of shiny metals. It can be very awkward. When I isolate shapes and faces, sometimes it's important to go around afterwards and just blur those edges because the edges can be very sharp looking. So once again, back into the principal BSDF to uh, see the edges so I can highlight and add in the shadows where needed. And you can see I'm being quite careful to follow the edge as I was saying earlier, because it's quite uh, chunky uh, and it's a sort of, I don't know, octagon shape uh, representing a circle. You have to be a bit precise uh, where your edges are so it doesn't look out of place. Then just highlighting the top where the light hits and then adding shadows on the bottom. So slowly getting there with the painting. The project itself is uh, fairly close to completion apparently. So it's looking about uh, February time uh, when the release of um, all the sort of new aspects. I know the game is kind of out there already being uh, tested, sort of alpha, beta stages and things. Uh, but this is the sort of final release uh, stuff I believe anyway. So my role as an artist will be coming to an end soon. I'm working on some sculpts at the moment, which is quite nice because they need some detailed sort of character uh, models uh, that they can use for different cards and things in different poses. So having fun doing that. So I'll release some videos about sculpting fairly soon. Obviously, I'm still really enjoying the project and hoping that there'll be more in the future. So you all need to go out and play Atlas Empires so that there can be more updates and things in the future and I can keep going with my artwork. <laughs> I'm also liking the fact that there's lots of variation with the job. So there's been lots of interesting models. I've had to do sort of backgrounds and different things like that. And now onto some sculpting. So really glad of all the opportunities that it's given me. 
That's always the struggle for beginner artists, and I know what it feels like to be in that situation where you need to get more experience, you need to keep working hard on your portfolio, but you really need some work as well. Uh, so ideally, you want to be working and improving at the same time. So finding jobs as a beginner can be quite tough. Lots of people are asking me things like, where do I go to get jobs and so forth? And it's a really tough one. It depends on your level really as well. And sometimes you will probably have to do uh, projects for free or at least um, deferred payments. So maybe be part of a project or part of a team that's building up a game and then you'll get paid if it's successful in a sense. But unfortunately, that's just the way it is with these things. It's not easy, is it? But that's kind of how it is for beginners. It's quite a tough one. Now you can see there I had a slight glitch with the model where I couldn't paint onto a face and I had to go across to the UV map on the left hand side to paint, uh, which is quite rare in Blender like I said earlier, but it happened a fair few times in this particular model and I'm not really sure why. I think it's because of the texture detail, there was just wasn't enough pixels there for me to paint on. Which is kind of strange because this model set isn't particularly detailed if you think about all the buildings that I've done and there's 10 of those in a set. But because they were so individualistic, uh, they're taking up a lot of space on the texture map. So the other ones where they're modular, there's uh, lots of times that modules reused. But in this one, uh, the only real thing that's modular as such is the rocket. Um, sometimes they use twice or so. But generally speaking, there's lots of bespoke stuff in this particular set, which is probably why it took me so long. I really enjoyed the billows part. This was quite fun for some reason. Uh, maybe it's just a, a different object, something uh, slightly new. And when you come across something you haven't painted before, it's uh, quite a challenge, so it's uh, quite fun. You can see that the sort of wooden parts to each end are duplicated, but they look fine uh, duplicated, so uh, that's where a module can work quite well. And then this middle part, I think, is mirrored across uh, the center. So again, that's not too bad. I've just got to be careful not to put too much detail on the top. And I think I may have gone around the model, adding a bit more ambient occlusion in places, but generally we're just about there. You can see the rocket fins still have yellow on them. So you can see that's a bit of an issue with that sort of modular design and they shouldn't really be showing any sort of flames or reflections of flames on them there. But I think I'd just about get away with it here. So there we have it, the rocket set. If you have any questions then do comment below. If you're still with me and watching all the way through, well done. I hope you're enjoying the series. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.